All right, uh, let's get started. Before we dive in, um, those hopefully everyone saw the Piazza message. Note that I, so I decided to uh, extend the homework one deadline to tomorrow night to give you some extra time since uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but I do know there were a total of 600 submissions to the system as of office hours yesterday at 10 a.m. And I just checked, and there were 1,600 like since then. So <laughs> roughly 1,000 submissions with, like, if everyone is a smoke test and a real submission, that's like 500 submissions. And I'm sure I did not look at the data, but I'm sure they're all clustered around the 10 p.m. to 12 p.m. window. <laughs> um, so I guess I did not have enough. Uh, servers and CPUs running to test all of those. So uh, for that, so for people that were able to do it beforehand, uh, since you did stuff on time, which is always good, uh, if you got 100%, you'll get an extra five points on that. Um, everyone else, you have two extra days, no penalty. Yes. Wait, so only if you got 100%? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I give you five points for not finishing the assignment. Well, because <laughs> Because you did it before the deadline? I thought, yeah, 90 was, I thought 90 was good enough. Like, it's, yeah, it's good if that's good enough for you. That's fine. Great. Yeah. I mean, 95 is better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I think that's fair. We'll have a new assignment on Tuesday. I spun up four new servers, so it should be twice as fast. Or not twice as fast, but twice as much capacity. So we should be fine on that. And then the other thing I'm going to do that I uh, realized is I'm going to send out like a sh like a test.sh script that you can run locally to make sure that it can compile and that the input runs correctly the way it should. Because um, a lot of people are having problems with, I think it's what is it, C++ for some reason spins forever when you do end of file when you're using certain reading things, which is not cool. Uh, so that actually blew up a lot of stuff because then people's, rather than their their submissions taking a few amount of time that took the maximum amount of time, which is I think probably three or four minutes per submission. And so that also gummed up the queue and there's all kinds of stuff, but uh, cool. Any questions on that? Who did it in the craziest language? Well, I don't know, like C or C++ is not crazy. Java is definitely not crazy. Like a language you didn't necessarily learn in your classes. Yeah. What? Go. You did it in Go. I remember that from office hours. Yeah, I did it in Go too. Go. Anything else? And we do Rust. <coughs> what? Oh, Dart? What's Dart? I can't. Google's other Go. Okay. Yeah, that's like a Rust. Is that like a Rust type thing that's supposed to replace C? But it's basically. Like an upgraded JavaScript. Ah, like okay. A better TypeScript. Okay, interesting. Okay, so TypeScript plus. Anybody prologue? No, nobody did prologue, did you? <laughs> That'd be crazy. I would be super interested in seeing that. Anybody do any Lisp like languages? Scheme? No. Anybody? PHP? Yeah, did anybody actually do that? I mean, it should be PHP is C ish. It should be straightforward ish, but. Yeah. Anyways, maybe I'll do that next year. I have a bounty for like the most obscure language possible. Uh, ooh, that'd be good. So I could do it whatever language you do it in. If you get some bonus points depending on how many other people choose that language, which then incentivizes all of you to choose some weird esoteric language and then actually get it to work. Anyways, cool. All right, so back to... Mandatory access control. So what's mandatory access control? Mandatory. Mandatory. What does that mean? Besides? Required. Required. Who requires it? The system. Yeah, the system. And why is it useful? That an individual doesn't own the files. So that way, yeah, so that way individuals don't get to choose who has access to what files, right? So. As opposed to what's the other type? What are the other types of kind of access control models? Uh, discretionary. Discretionary access control. Who controls what access to files in discretionary? The owner. The owner of the file controls who gets to access that file. What's the third one we talked about? Originator control. Originator control. What's the difference there? Uh, the 
originator of the object. The originator of what? Uh, the object. The object or the data, right? Whatever the, so it's kind of separating that concept of objects, which can be considered files, is actually who initially created that data. So it doesn't matter how many times you copy that data, the originator would still be able to control who accesses that. Great. Okay, perfect. Now I have a nice pen so you can get my great handwriting. So we talked about so we talked about security levels and we talked about mandatory access control and the concept of having a hierarchy of levels. So we talked about what was the low level? Unclassified. I was above that. Classified. Classified. Above that. Secret. 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 Above that. Top secret. Top secret. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. So then, what were the rules that we derived for for reading and writing data in here? Or let's go with reading first. Yes. Um, it, okay, with reading is from top secret down to unclassified. Reading went down, which meant that the subject has to be at, have to be so. Thinking about that, does that mean, so if you, if a uh, subject has secret security clearance and the object has confidential, can they read it? Yes. If the subject has secret and the object has secret, can they read it? Yes. It's got some conflicting, usually if it's the same thing, I will just continue, but. Yes. Yes? Why yes? The subject and the object are at the same level. They're at the same level, right? So you should be able to read things at your level. So what if the subject is at secret and the object's at top secret? No. no, we should block that. You should not be able to read up, so you can only read down. Perfect. What about writing? Yeah. You can only write up, so you can only write at your level or higher. Right. So these are some of the kind of questions that we can talk about. Is uh, you are a you have secret level clearance? Can you write an unclassified object? No. Why? Right, to ensure that there's no possible way for secret information to leak out. Um, as we talked about in a real system, there's ways to purposely kind of lower your level to the unclassified level so you can write unclassified data. Um, because otherwise, in this organization, no information would ever flow out of this organization, right, or down the ranks. Cool. But why is this model not, why is this, too coarse grain. What's the problem with our current way of thinking about access control with these four levels? It's just the levels, so there's no category or specification. Yeah, but why don't we just add more levels? Why don't we add like a kind of secret between confidential and secret, and then add a like middle secret in between secret and top secret, and then add a super top secret secret? Uh, well, you can. So go back to how, how do we define these levels, or what was kind of the intuition behind defining these levels? Or think about it a different way. You are in charge of this system. You have a piece of data. What do you classify that data as? What do you use as your criteria? Uh, based on how like, dangerous it is if it got out. Yeah, based on how harmful it is to the organization if that data gets out, right? And so you can th see things like the codes to launch, launch nuclear missiles. Is that a dangerous? piece of information to be out? Yes. So you would have that at the topmost level. Um, but as we talked about, you'd have multiple pieces of information at the top secret level, or at, let's say, whatever that top level is. But if you have access to top secret, then you have access to all of that data. So it doesn't make sense that just because you're working on a, I don't know, a super secret, uh, I, I don't know, uh, the example is kind of, Let's say, yeah, so the top secret data, you have, you work um, developing cool exploits for the NSA, which is class, possibly classified at the top secret level. Should you also have access to um, all of the nuclear codes and all of the other codes? And so we've talked about clearly, no, that doesn't make sense. So what actually happens? So what system did they come up with to deal with this? Categories and what are cat like what like the top space 
Yeah, so we had some examples of like nuclear, NATO, ACE. There's a lot of them. You can actually just Google for like security categories. Um, and the key example, and this is what somebody brought up in our discussion on Tuesday, is that the key idea is this need to know basis. Do you actually need to know this information or not? So how do we define our policy now? Because our policy used to be really easy, right? Read down, write up, done. And how does even thinking about so let's, let's walk through some examples now. So let's say that now we have, uh, we have top secret, we have secret, classified, unconfidential, or unclassified. So we still have our hierarchy. But now we have things like, uh, let's say, nuclear and NATO. So we have then these categories. So let's say we're a subject. We're at, let's say, top secret security clearance. What other information do I need to know about a subject in order to determine what things they can access? Yeah. The category they belong to? We need the category, right? So we need not just the level, so we use the, uh, let's go to notation, right? So we used to use just the level of, well, the level of this subject, uh, let's go SL, is top secret, but now we need more information. And we can think about this as a set, so does it, does it make sense? I mean, should a person just have one category access? No, the person could have multiple, be a member of multiple categories, right? So over here, this subject, so this is a terrible curly brace, so it'd be something kind of like this. Um, so I could have access to NATO, and then, and then, Let's say we have some document, some object, and the security clearance here is, let's say, classified, and it's nuclear. Should I be able to read this object? No. No, why not? Or yes, why not? Or why? Mm -hmm. No, it's outside your category. Say it again? No, because it's outside a category. That yeah, you but I have higher. I'm at the top secret level. Yeah, but you don't need to know about this. Right, but I don't need to know about this because I'm not. I'm not classified for this category, right? I don't need to know about any of the nuclear stuff. So even if it's at the classified level, I still can't read it, even though my security clearance is higher, right? So what if I then change now this to NATO? Can I read this object? Can I write to this object? No, why not? Right, because then I'm essentially, again, leaking information from top secret down to confidential. So right? the L stands for leak or something? The L stands for level. So this is level. the security level of some subject S and the security level of some object O. Um, the notation isn't super critical here. It's just it's in for okay. Yeah. So, okay, so we said I can... I, ca I can read this document, I can't write, or I can read this object, I can't write to this object. And we said if I, if, so what if there's an empty set? Can I now read to this object? Can I read this object? Sure. Why? It's not associated with any category, so how do we treat it then? Yeah, just like we did in the previous access, right? So we can read it. Can we write to this object? No. Why not? Right, because you can only write up, and we may be leaking information about this NATO category to an object that has no category designation. Right? Awesome. Cool. What if I have no category? Can I read this object? Yes. yes. Can I write to it? No. What are the rules for this? So what are the rules for reading or writing where there's no categories? Just the same, exactly. It's exactly the same as what we just derived up here, right? So then, so then how do we think about, okay, so we said, well, the security clearance is very kind of easy in some sense because we already have that. But how do we deal with these ideas of categories? 
So let's say I have nuclear and NATO. So should I be able to read this object that has category of NUC? Yes. Why? Yes, so it's a part of my list of categories. But what if this object now is nuclear and ace? You can't read it because it's not part of your list of categories. Right, and this is in terms of sets. So now think about it in terms of sets. So what's the relationship that we're trying to get here? Set union? I've heard this before. Um, so if the set is set set intersection or something? Subset. So there's a, we want a subset relationship, right? So we want, uh, we can read objects where uh, the first part matches, just like we said, that the security clearance is at or below us, and that the categories of the object are a subs or a, I forget what's the subset or, or equivalent to. It's like a C. Uh, it's like a C. Yeah, like the C bar. with the, the lower bar underneath it. I forget how to pronounce it. Um, so what we want, basically, so if we have the category, we want to say is essentially, so read, for reading, we basically have the same one. So the key thing to always remember is if our access is secret and this is a top secret document, should we be able to access it even though we have all the categories? No. No, because fundamentally we still need to keep this top secret secret, this level hierarchy, right? So, and this is exactly what we have. So, and the way to actually express this is very cool. So, <coughs> what we can do is we can construct basically a lattice based around this subset relationship. So, at the bottom of this lattice, we have an empty set because the empty set is a subset of every set. Do you agree with that? Yep. Right? There's always nothing inside of a set. I guess. And at the top, so what's the topmost element where everything else will be a subset of that element? Uh, the set of all the universe. The set of all categories, yeah. So that's the topmost level. <laughs> and then what we're going to do is we're going to draw a, um, we'll draw an edge in this graph when one set has a subset relationship. So we can think of at the bottommost level, we have the set containing a uh, new the second containing NATO, the second containing ACE, and all and the empty set is all a subset of each of these. But are they subsets of each other? No. Exactly. Cool. So what's gonna be at the next layer? Two of them combined. Right. All the sets containing two elements. So we'll first have the second containing nuclear and NATO. So then what are the edges going to be? to both nuclear and NATO, right? Because the, the object, the set containing nuclear and NATO, the set containing nuclear is a subset of that, and the set containing NATO is a subset of that. And we can just keep going. <coughs> and we get this super cool structure at the very top of this, because we just have three elements. We will have the set containing nuclear, NATO, and ACE. So we can use, so how can we actually use this lattice to answer the question of can this subject read this object. <coughs> Say it again. The category must be a subset. The category of the what? So the object. The category of the object must be a subset of the subject, right? So we can look here. We can say, well, if this is the subject, right? The subject has nuclear and NATO. Then they can read objects that, and the other way to read this graph is, does the uh, empty set, is that a subset of nuclear and NATO? Yes. Yes, so there's a transitive property here, but we're not drawing, you don't draw all the edges, because that gets insane. Uh, so then we can easily say, so we can say, oh look, if nuclear and NATO, or if the object is nuclear and the subject is nuclear and NATO, they can read it because it's a subset, and you can keep doing this, and then, but you can say the flip side, if the object is nuclear, NATO, and ACE, then the person cannot read it, and right is just flipped around the opposite way, just as we had it before. And this is 
actually gives rise to one of the most famous models of security. This is the Bell La Padula model, um, <coughs> which we just figured out with um, discussing it. And it uses this concept on a lattice of dominates. So here we're using subset relationships, uh, but thinking exactly what we talked about of nuclear NATO dominate all of these nodes of nuclear NATO and the empty set. Um, so you express this more formally. You have some security level L, and again here now we have categories. So it's not just the security level L, but the security level is L with the set of categories. So if one security level dominates the other security level if and only if L prime is less than or equal to L and C prime is a um, subset or equal to C. And then once we do that, with this definition of dominates, we can use that to describe exactly. So you, this is us defining our intuition of what we just created when we talked about these sets, right? So we talked about, we defined it in terms of uh, L prime, or of less than or equal to, and subset relationship. So we define an operator to do this, which is nicer because then we don't have to put this all over the place. And so now our security conditions become simple. We can say a subject can read O if and only if S dominates O. And the star property, which is the right property that we talked about, is S can write to O if and only if the object dominates S. So this is the exact same concept we talked about of read down, write up, but now with this idea of categories in terms of sets and subset relations. Questions? Now once you have this, you can do the same thing that we talked about previously. Uh, you can then prove that no top secret information can be leaked out in this model, which is a nice property to have if you want to enforce this system. Because that's the security property you really care about. Yeah? Except uh, you said already that there's yes. a way to like make yourself, to, in order for like, someone that's in a higher security clearance to like publish information of the lower level, since obviously we wouldn't be able to do anything otherwise. Yes, and that's the, the key word here is model. So Bell and Lepadula are last names of people. It's not a random name. You can go look up this paper. I think it's from the 70s, but I don't remember correctly. Um, but this actually kicked off the idea of like, because be even before this, people, you know, like, Without heavy mathematical proofs of being able to prove that a model is secure, there was like, well, why even worry about security or think about security? So then you could think of, well, if you, you would extend this model to incorporate those elements, but you still, at the end of the day, have to trust all these things, right? If this is still a system. People can leak information, and so that doesn't actually, there's no technical way to stop it. Yeah. So <coughs> if you had to uh, rename it without using last names, something more expressive, would it be something like, Lattice access control model? Or like what, what would you name it? I'd probably name it something like the Lattice uh, mandatory access control model. Is probably because it's specifically about mandatory access control okay. and around this concept of lattices. And actually, to be honest, um, this is one of the reasons why I like doing this is because this lattice concept comes up a lot in a lot of different types of computer science. Yeah, um, is, do we have like a for, uh, is it the formal definition of lattice or is it just kind of like uh, it looks like lattice? There is a formal definition. I do not have it off the top of my head. Uh, I'm not a very mathematically inclined person, but if it's you, there. it's yes, for sure. There is a definition, and I believe it's around. You need some kind of relation which is similar to a subset relation. It can actually be any type of thing that you're comparing. Uh, you could think of like less than would create a lattice, but it would be just a. It would just be a long line of things, so it's not a really interesting lattice, but. You could do um, all kinds of things. This actually comes up in program analysis, where if you want to, let's say, try to analyze a program statically to understand what values each of the variables in the program can hold at different program points, you model possible string values with this, where at the top of the lattice you have a star, which means this variable can hold anything. And at the bottom, you have null, where you know it's null. Uh, the problem is that lattice becomes infinite, and then you get into this problem that you can never actually finish, and so you have to have techniques to kind of deal with that. Um, so you can do cool things, like uh, you can do substring or 
prefix string analysis to determine, which is super interesting, like if you want to look at, we actually did this in a project, we wanted to understand what URLs uh, mobile apps were opening, like Android apps, and so <coughs> we did an analysis and you can build, basically think of it as this lattice where prefix uh, string, so you actually don't care about the rest of the string because you want to understand, is it HTTP they're talking, is it HTTPS, is it a local file, uh, these kind of things, so. Anyways, this concept comes up a lot. Uh, there are far better people to explain it than I, though. Yeah, please. Um, in this um, access control model, if you have a subject that dominates the object, mm -hmm. can the subject rewrite the object at their security level? Interesting. Okay, good question. So let's think about this. So. Um, so, okay, so you have a subject dominates an object, right? So, so the question is, can the subject read the object? Yes. Yes. Can they create a new object with the exact same security level as the old object and write to it? No. No, but what can they do? Why, why not? Because they're <laughs> They actually can in one case. If it's like the same, if the subset is yeah, if the equivalence, right? If you have an object that's at your security level with exactly the same categories, you can read that object and create a new object with that same level and same categories. But if you're reading a, an object and you want to create a new object, what are the properties of that new object that must hold? It's at your level or higher, exactly. So that object dominates your security clearance. Right, so this is that idea. So you could create, you could read a lower level object and then create a new object at your same security level and category, and then now that's good and everything's fine. Which is kind of that idea of writing up. And somebody else could do that with your object, but it's fine because the only thing you're bringing up is kind of less sensitive information into more secure information. Right, you may then have to think, well, is that old information actually at the proper level, and so you may need to think about that, but it's a different problem. Yeah? Can people at a higher security level uh, delete objects at a lower security level? Interesting. I would say that in this model, okay, let's think about that. So what do you mean by delete? Uh, like, like, I, like erase it, like so. So, if, what, like, so what are the two actions that subjects can do in this model? Read and write. Read and write. So what would delete be? It would be a write, probably. It would be a write. So can a top secret person overwrite a classified information? No. No, because they can only write at their level or up. And again, this is because what is of the three security properties that we talked about originally? What security property is this model trying to enforce? What are the three security properties? Confidentiality. Confidentiality. Integrity. Integrity. Availability. Availability, CIA. Yeah, confidentiality, integrity, availability. What does this model care about? Confidentiality. Confidentiality, right? The entire goal is so that uh, information does not leak out of the organization. So it's all about confidentiality. They actually don't care about, uh, in this case, they don't care about integrity at all. Which means that you could actually have somebody, so think about somebody at the unclassified level, could they overwrite top secret data with this model? Yes. Yeah, because they can write to some document and technically delete it, but uh, you could think about that would be an easy thing to extend to then reason about and, and not allow them to. <coughs> but uh, that's if you just, so this is a, this is, you know, again, model means you only do these two things and that's it. Cool, good questions. Any other questions? Burning questions you've been holding on to for the last week that you desperately need answers yet <laughs> about uh, this class? So it just kind of uh, confuses me a little bit. So yeah. I mean like, like what you said, um, a person like from unclassified can delete like top secret data basically. Can can write to top secret data as all this model says, but I mean we're saying that like write includes deleting. 
possibly. I think that's one definition. You could think of, do you even know the name of the file to delete if you think about it in terms of files? You could think that delete could be a different operation. But then, so I guess my question more is like, well, like, if a person from unclassified is writing to top secret, mm -hmm. I just don't see how like that's not possible like information leak. Ah, well, can they? So let's say you have a top secret document, the nuclear codes. You're at the unclassified model. In this, at the unclassified level, at this level, how do you leak that information? What's the only way you can get those codes? You only have two actions. Reading, Reading and writing. writing. So of those two, which is going to give you the information? Reading. reading. Can you read a top secret document in this model? No. But even if you overwrote them, you still don't know what those original contents were. And the question is, what are they being used for, right? If those, if your new codes are then used to prime nukes, then you have a clear problem, right? And that's more about the provenance of data. Like, where did that data come from? Which is something you could tack on to the end of who changed this last. And then you could decide whether to trust it or not. Yeah. So, but if you wrote the nuclear codes yes. as an unclassified individual, like if you, I don't know, for some reason you were unclassified and you wrote them, sure. you would have, you wouldn't be able to read them anymore, but you would, you know, like as a person, you would have that information because you yeah. wrote them. That's exactly, yes. Question. But the question is, does that give you anything, right? Because it, it, it all depends on, because at any point somebody else could go and overwrite that information, but still you don't know, you still don't know what that was original, because like if you think about it, whoever originally created that data, they explicitly tagged it as, uh, as top secret. Yeah, I mean, if what if an un, for some reason an unclassified person was the originator of the data, or someone of a lower security clearance was the originator of the data, so they have yes. the original contents of the nuclear codes. Correct. You would have to deal with that. <laughs> so you would like whoever's in charge of that would elevate their security clearance up to top secret or something, right? Um, yeah. This is. Uh, have you heard of that thing of like, um, I guess it happens in physics or something where you're like, where they say like, okay, uh, imagine a spherical, a spherical cow, cow. Yeah. right? So it's kind of the same thing of like, you're, you're, you're simplifying reality into this model that definitely doesn't make sense, but allows you to do some interesting things with it. But yes, this is the problem with all models in general is they definitely do not capture all these real world conditions. And so part of the interesting thing, and I'm sure if you look at this model, I'm sure people have proposed all kinds of ways to actually, but the problem is by improving this model, you still need to prove the security properties that no data can leak. And so for every modification you make to make this model more realistic, you then have to go and prove that it still has the original properties you wanted. And so yes, it becomes less useful in some sense because that becomes more difficult. Yeah, so you like assume you have humans who can have their own free will in this system. I don't know. Everything breaks. Cool. Awesome. So okay, so we have two objects or two, let's say, things for now, A and B. A has top secret and ace. B has secret NATO ace. So can A as a subject read a document that's top secret and has no categories? Can A, and I'm actually not going to tell you if you're right or wrong, this is just going to be a fun exercise. So can A write to a document that is S and Ace? No. 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 Why not? Because I see right? Same level. Uh, you have to write at the same level. But it has the same categories. It's the same level. No. Yes, but it's not at the same level. This is what trips people up a lot before I'm reiterating this, right? Uh, the problem is the secret there. Can they read a top secret document that is NATO and ACE? No. No. Can they write to a top secret document that is NATO and ACE? Yes. No. No. Sure. Yeah. Why not? Ooh, this is a good one. Oh, okay, we have to talk about. Okay, so you think about the security levels first. Can they write to something that's at their level? Yes. 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 What were the requirements on writing? 
the object, object dominates the subject. The object dominates the subject, which means in terms of what for this set? Uh, that the object set of categories is what compared to the subject set? A, a since, I, I, maybe something else. Uh, it's a super the set. object is a subset of the subject. subject? Object is a superset. That the objects categories are a superset of the subjects categories. Is that true? Yes. Yes. Again, you can think of this as writing up. And the key thing, if you want to check yourself, is thinking about does this leak any information? So what knowledge does the subject potentially know here? Ace. Yeah, they know everything that is top secret that has no category and also ace information. So if they create a document that is top secret and is tagged with ACE and NATO, they're not leaking any information out because people who can read this document have to have what clear what categories? Top secret ACE. ACE and NATO, which means they must have ACE, which means it's totally fine for them to read this document. Right? All right, can B, so B is secret, NATO ace. Can B write to a document that is secret and is NATO? No. 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 Fight, fight, fight. No. no. <laughs> Why yes? Because it's at the same level. It's at the same level. And it's not a secret. Right. Right. Oh, it's an object. Right? So because. Now, because and what's the key information leakage problem here? It can leak ace information. Yes, the ace category can leak into this document, right? Because <laughs> B has access to all of NATO and all of ace, which means if they create a document that is only tagged NATO, that means people who only have NATO will get access to ace information. Does that make sense? Can they read a top secret document that is NATO and ace? Yes. Yes, no. why yes? No, no they can't. Yeah. Why not? Because you can only read the hundred. Yes, because of the security levels here, right? The sets are the same, the categories are the same, the levels are the thing that matters. Can they read a document that is secret and is ace and nuclear? Yes. No. 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 Yeah. Why yes? Both. Why no? Uh, well, can't they? What about the level? Levels Can't fine. they levels the same? What are the categories? Ace, ace is fine, but nuclear is not. But can't they read anything like below their level? In the same category. If they don't have the nuclear, what was it? Exactly, reading on a need to know basis, right? Because if they're able to read this file, what do they have access to? Nuclear. Nuclear, nuclear information that they should not have access to because they only have access to NATO and ACE. Exactly, so this should be blocked, right? If you think about it, it's because these categories on the lattice, do they dominate each other? No. No, they're next to each other, right? There's no way to compare. There's no subset relationship between NATO ace and ace nuke. Neither is a subset of the other, right? So this person cannot read from this file. Can they write to that file? Is that the next one? No, no. Let's go to this. Can they write to this file? Yeah. No. No. Yeah, they can. No, they can't. Yes, so they can't because they could leak what information to this file? NATO. NATO, NATO right? We don't care about the ace information because this is tagged as ace, but they cannot write to this to this object because they would be leaking NATO information to this object. It's a little trickier than we thought on first blush, maybe. Can they write to an unclassified document that has no security? No. no. Why not? Why? Lower level. Lower level, yeah, the security levels are lower. Cool. <laughs> so these are not, yeah, please. Um, I don't know if it fits in with the model, but are there ever like categories that do trump each other? Say that again? You mean like creating categories that are in themselves security levels? I'm sure you could. Uh, could you construct that with this? Could you just make a new level with just that one category? You could make a new level, or you could. 
You could create categories at each of the levels. So you could have nuke unclass, nuke secret, nuke talk secret, and use that in some sense. And then you'd have to make sure you gave everyone who had top secret access to all the other ones, but you could create something similar. But it doesn't just slot right in, it kind of gets messy. It would just make it complicated. Exactly, yeah. I mean, not that everything's not complicated, but, uh, yeah. yeah. What were the first four again? Was, uh, uh, I don't know, you'll have to go back on the tape later and view them or think about it and talk to your fellow students. <laughs> I know, talking to people. You can do it anonymously on the message board, too, so. Oh, that's weird. Oh. Okay, cool. So, we are, oh, actually, oh, interesting. What time is it? Wow, we are ahead of schedule. I'll do this quickly. <laughs> awesome. Cool, okay, so, key thing, uh, so there are other <coughs> types of access control models that are based on things that we did not talk about. So what, what was kind of, for all of these models, what were some of the key notions about subjects that affected whether somebody could access an object or not? Subject needs to dominate the object in all the So in the mandatory access control, we had basically that uh, we needed to know the security level of the subject and we needed to know the categories. What about for discretionary? But maybe the relationship of the subject to the object, like whether they created it or whether they're part of the group that created it. Or the owner of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. For discretionary access control, it was all about ownership, who owns what object, and that determines what they can do with it. Um, so there's other types of things, and there, we started to think about applying these to like even a classroom setting. So we, I think, talked about, I don't remember how long ago it's been. Time is very tricky. But we talked about, uh, like the online, the My ASU webpage, like for this class where you sign up for classes and I get to see a different view. Or you think about My ASU in general. When you go there, you see different things than I do. Why is that? Because you need access to more things than you do. Why? But what about me gives me access to more things? Is it my name? Yes. Yes. Yes, so all atoms get access to more stuff in black position. My position? What about my position? Your teacher. Your yeah, so like my role in the university, right, is a teacher, instructor, professor, whatever you want to say. So I have a different view than you. What's your role in the university? Student. I always said troublemaker. All right, good. So students, your students, professors, what other roles are there in the university? Graders. Graders? What else? TAs. TAs. Janitors. Advisors. Advising. Staff, make sure things run, right? Administrators, presidents, tutors. Yeah, so you may, so there's a whole area of access control that's based on roles. And this actually is something that translates very nicely into organizations, right? So in an organization, what kind of roles do you have generally? Supervisors. Like supervisors or managers, what else? Employees, like, you know, which could be a, a huge set of employees, and then you have a subset of managers. Uh, you can have a subset of, like, uh, C style, like CEO style people. Um, and the idea here is that the permissions are not determined by whether you own the file or what, but about the user's role. So, in this way, you define access control rules in terms of what roles can do what things. Uh, what about like websites? What are some roles on a website? So we talked about the ASU one. What about like generally? Admin. What was it? Admin. admin. So an admin on a website. What else? A visitor versus like a registered user. Yeah, like a guest versus a registered user who has an account. Maybe an unpaid account versus a paid account. Right. These are all different kinds of roles that actually slot very easily. That you could easily think about access control in terms of these rather than thinking about individual users access, right? Because you don't really care about if specific, well, in some cases you, you make things. Um, so, and as contrasts with kind of discretionary access control, the user's permission is based on their identity, which user they are and what files they own. Whereas mandatory access control is really based on like clearance, like what are you cleared to view? Um, 
Uh, another really interesting thing, and this is something that comes up, uh, maybe I'm trying to think of what example I want to give, but uh, so attribute-based access control is another different type and area of access control. And the idea here is really, so what are the What are the rules around, um, say, buying alcohol in a state? You must be 21 or older. You have to be 21 or older. Do they care what your name is? No. Do they care where you live? No. Well, do they care? Let me get out my ID. Do they care about your um, eye color? Yes. Your hair color, your height, <laughs> your weight, whether you're an organ donor. Do they care about, what do they care about? Just the age. Just, do they even actually care about your age? What do they actually care about? Uh, whether your date of birth is like past or second. What if it's fake? We'll get to that in a second. But. What do they actually care about? What's the thing that they're checking? Are you 21 or older? Do they care if you're 22 or if you're 65? Maybe. Well, some places they let you, well, without an ID. Right, but legally, right? So the idea behind attribute-based access control is, and then the problem is, well, one problem is when you go to a store, you're giving them this card that has not just your age on it, which is the attribute they want to check, but it has all these other attributes they want to check. Um, and so the idea behind attribute-based access control is kind of saying, hey, what if we split people up instead of just their, it's kind of like a more fine-grained role-based access control of giving people, employees, different attributes and then being able to check based on those attributes. So this would be basically if there's some cool way for the state of Arizona to issue you a digital attribute that says you are 21 and over that you could then present to the cashier and it would verify that you actually are 21 or old, older without even revealing your birth date or where you live or any of this other information that is on your, um, or you could think of other attributes would be like, are you a student? Does Chipotle still do this where they give you free, free soda if you show a student ID? What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, go some, that. some places have like this kind of uh, yeah, or let's say Amazon, yeah, you get, or GitHub, you get free, um, free private accounts as long as you have an EDU account or Amazon's EDU account, right? These are all things that what they're using is usually email-based authentication to see if you have it or not, but it would be kind of cool, and this is what attribute-based access control tries to deal with, uh, how do you actually create these attributes such that other people can verify them? Um, and so what's really cool is you can make complex Boolean expressions on these attributes. You could, you could really do complicated things by saying, um, if you're a member of this group and you're of this age, then you get access to these things. Uh, so it really allows really fine-grained access control rules that can help people uh, do those kinds of things. And so, and there's a whole host of kind of other types of access control. And and some of the interesting things of, if you think about, and I was thinking about, okay, so what's the cool research topics here? What's actually kind of, because what you're learning about is the stuff that is kind of current, right? But scientists are going out there trying to research and push the bounds here. So one key thing is usability. So we talked about, um, we talked about uh, usability in terms of mechanisms and security mechanisms. If a mechanism isn't usable, then people will either misdeploy it or remove it. So how do you, if I say, hey, I have this awesome access control <coughs> policy, you just need to write a 500 line Python <coughs> program to implement your policy, and then everything will magically work. Do you think everybody's gonna be able to do that correctly? <coughs> or even worse, I have some complex language that I created that you can write your access control language in and everything will just work. Right, so how do you actually create this in a usable way? How can you create access control that's flexible, that actually is realistic with the real world and real world access and access control? Um, how expressive is the access control? This is something that we ran into when talking about Unix. He said the Unix model only has these 12 bits, and man, it doesn't allow us to express things that we want. Um, another thing is federation. So 
which is essentially two organizations deciding to collaborate. So, for instance, um, wasn't it? Doesn't ASU let any Starbucks employee have like free online courses from ASU? That was a partnership that was announced. Yeah. How do they actually determine that they're a valid employee? Does ASU just have a list of all the Starbucks employees. Do you think Starbucks wants to give us that? I think, I think you apply through like uh, Starbucks Corporation. Yeah, so, but then at some point, you need to apply, you need to create an ASU account. So ASU has to validate with Starbucks that you are an active employee. What happens if you leave after you have that account? It probably updates. Mm -hmm. Or like Starbucks and... Something must happen, right? So the idea is here, how do you have access control policies that kind of expand multiple organizations? Um, which is pretty interesting. Any questions on kind of the frontiers of access control and research? What flexibility? What, what's that? Wait. Um, flexibility would be it's it's um, allowing kind of the access control to more naturally deal with what humans do. So, for instance, um, you think about me in my office, right? So, like, I have a key to my office, which should mean in very strict terms. What should that mean? Only I have access to that office, right? But if I lose my keys, am I just like, I have to go find them again? Like, what happens? You're fired. I'm fired. They're just like, that office is now no longer usable by anyone. <laughs> so just a bunch of offices that are empty with ghosts in them because nobody, everyone lost their keys. You have to get a new key? Yeah, I have to get a new key from the office, or I go up to the CS office because somebody has a <coughs> spare keys for every floor. I can even go to, I think Brickyard has um, the building security. They can actually let you into an office, but I have to kind of convince them that I am that person. So I'd probably show my ID that has my name and my name's outside my office. So they would hopefully let me in based on that. Um, but still like something, you know, flexibility in that sense, because in a computer system, you forget your password, you're just locked out, right? And so you have to build in these mechanisms, and so how can you actually support that in a way that is uh, flexible while still maintaining the security requirements? Cool. All right, we will move on. I'm going to stop this. No, no, works. Okay, cool. All right, so now we get to the part uh, that is pretty fun of cryptography. So, what was part of the problem when we were talking about we, uh, when we, we had a discussion about we wanted to create a link to a file that we could share with people that anyone with that link could access that file? What were some of the things that we tried to do or mechanisms that we tried to do? Yeah, so we needed this notion of that the path was kind of random enough that nobody could uh, could guess it. And so what have you heard about cryptography? So what does cryptography mean to you? I don't know what that means. Those are just random words. Oh, it means the... I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, you with encryption. Encryption? So what's encryption? Yeah. A lot of XORs. Sorry. Huh? A lot of XORs. Say again. A lot of XORs. That is definitely true. Yeah. <laughs> A way of securing information, so it's hard to know what it is. What's what's the purpose? Like, why why do we even care? Right. So we talked about kind of these these access control models, and we said with this mandatory access control, we have this system that kind of enforces access. We can have these all these great properties, but really at the end of the day, you need to actually share information with people, right? And you need to send information. So how can you actually ensure in a technical way that that data is um, in some sense safe? So what's the security property here that we care about? Authenticity. Authenticity. What's that? Authenticity. Not quite. Integrity. Close. Integrity. 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 Maybe. Yeah. 
confidentiality. So yeah, so we want to keep so we want to try to keep secret data secret with confidentiality, and have only those people that we want to know be able to know and understand the data. So it's helpful to kind of pull the word apart. Um, I don't know Greek, but apparently it's derived from the Greek words for hidden secret and writing, which kind of makes sense. It used to be this hidden uh, writing, and the whole idea is how do we keep at a high level? It's about how do we keep information secret or hidden. And this is going to be kind of that driving force behind what we're studying and what we're learning about here. Um, so we need to nail down some kind of terminology at the start. So, uh, or let's, we'll pull back a little bit. So our goal here is we want to communicate some information from one party to another party. And we want to keep that information secret. When would that be useful? If somebody were Sorry, Sorry we go back here? Yeah, close it. What? Credit cards. Credit, credit cards. cards pin yeah. Numbers. Well, you don't want me knowing about your credit card and your PIN no. numbers? No? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sending someone a password to account if they matched it. Yeah, send sharing a password with somebody so they can access it, like a Netflix account. Yeah. Sharing public Wi-Fi, so you're all using the same Wi-Fi. You'd want to make sure that everything, uh, everything that you're typing into that web page and all of your web pages, it's not shared with everyone else on that Wi-Fi. Yeah. Uh, Say that again. War? Yeah. So why why would uh, generals and yeah why I mean is it would it be useful? To know what your enemies are going to do. Yes. 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 Very much. Yes. Yes. Right? So this actually, I mean, a lot of what we'll see where cryptography came from came from military context because you have this problem where you need to communicate information to people about what you're doing or what the attacks were or where to move ships. And then the, your adversary would love to know that information about where your ships are going to be and what they're going to do. And so um, cryptography was really created in this way of trying to keep information hidden and secret. Any other areas we want? Yeah. Uh, maybe to comply with legal requirements, like FERPA, for example. I think you're not supposed to like put student information on an unencrypted drive. Yeah. So uh, student information is part of the FERPA requirements. Uh, why do we not want student information on an unencrypted drive? Because if it gets stolen, then anyone has access to it. Yeah. Then if anyone stole my laptop, they would get access to all that student information on there. If it's encrypted, then and comma they can't break the encryption or the key or whatever, then uh, they won't be able to find it. So Cryptography actually, it actually forms a basis, if you think about it, I mean, it came from this kind of war and uh, warfare context uh, from actually a long ways ago, but really kind of has such practical use nowadays, it's kind of crazy, right? So you think about, would you ever trust banking or doing anything on the internet if you had no way to guarantee that the information you're sending to the bank, nobody else can see it? or purchasing things online. We just talked about credit cards and PIN numbers. Would you purchase anything online if you knew that anyone who was listening on your Wi-Fi could steal that information? I mean, some people probably would. It actually probably still would work, is the sad part. But uh, there'd be a lot of security people screaming about how bad it was. And there'd be easy tools for criminals to sniff credit card numbers. Uh, it would be kind of a madhouse. So. So we need to, to lay down some terminology so we make sure we're all on the same page. So what do we mean by encryption? Yeah. Changing like a password phrase, like with some sort of code. Higher level. It doesn't have to be code. You can do this by hand, yeah. Yeah, so the process basically of turning, so we're going to define some terms. So plain text, so we usually think in cryptography, you have some plain text, which is some message you want to send to the other party. You want to encrypt that into ciphertext, which is some hopefully random gibberish that you can give them. And if anybody else reads it, they can't get the plain text back. Yeah. Or uh, can we also say that? Turn it into something that is undistinguishable from a random string? I would 
I would say that that is the property you want from a lot of encryption algorithms. You could have some crazy encryption algorithms that like spit out English text. Okay. Like you could map random bits to a, I don't know, depending on what you're trying to, if you wanted it to not quite look like random bytes, you could do things there. So at a high level, Isn't I think, that yeah. Steganography then? Isn't that hiding information inside other information? It can be, but you, yeah, it's, it's in some sense, yes. It, they're related. I don't know that I want to draw a fine distinction between the two, but but yeah, you can think of um, ways of that doing that. But but yeah, the idea is so encryption is you're transforming a message so from so a plain text message into some ciphertext that the meaning is concealed, and that's what we'll go with for now. We'll we'll get more deeper into the weeds here. Um, so what would be decryption? The opposite, taking some ciphertext and turning it into some plain text. We didn't talk about it all yet, how that happens. We'll go into all of that. Uh, but this is really good for now. And so this is this whole idea of how do you actually do these two steps? right? How can I even do this such that I have some message in my mind I transform it into something crazy, I give it to one of you, and only that person can decrypt it, but anyone else that gets it will not be able to turn it back into that plain text. It's, kind of, it's actually crazy that all this stuff works. Like, this is nuts. Um, so when we think about, so more terminology, so we think about a crypto system. So this would be basically a system that describes how to encrypt or decrypt messages. So you'd say, okay, with AES, this is how it works, or with this kind of crypto system, but all you need to define are those two functions that we talked about, which are encryption and, decryption. encryption and decryption. Thinking in terms of functions, what's their input? So what does encryption take as an input? Plain text. The plain text and outputs what? Ciphertext. Ciphertext, and what does decryption take? Ciphertext. Ciphertext and outputs? Cool, it was very good at a high level. We'll see that there's other inputs and outputs that are needed in most <laughs> crypto systems, but those will be crypto system specific. So. Uh, but at a high level, that's the really important thing to, co to consider there. Good. Plain text, cipher text. Uh, okay, cool. These are good terms just to know. A cryptographer is somebody who creates new encryption algorithms and new ways and new crypto systems that does super cool stuff. People who break crypto systems are called crypt analysts or usually just maybe a crypto analyst. Um, so you will be doing some of this at some point, of uh, analyzing crypto systems and breaking them. <coughs> so if we're able to do this without getting into the details, what are some of the benefits that we can get here of what we just talked about in terms of the CIA? Assume we have some crypto system, we can encrypt things, but the person we decrypt things. So it's communicate. Maybe. Well, how what would integrity mean in this sense? Uh, if somebody would like get that information, they wouldn't specifically be able to decrypt it. So but how's that integrity? What is integrity concerned with? Yeah. Yeah, so in this case, it'd be the plain text that I send you, you get exactly the same plain text back from that ciphertext. And then what's confidentiality in this context? Uh, that only the intended recipient can actually read it. Right, so that I have this plain text, I generate ciphertext, I can give this ciphertext to the entire world, but only my intended recipient will be able to actually decrypt it. So this is, and if you think about it in terms of what we've been talking about, right, this is kind of a mechanism that you can use to get confidentiality. Um, and you can also do cool things. Uh, we will use, uh, there'll be some crypto things to do integrity so that the person receiving the message can actually verify that um, it was the same message that you originally sent, that the plain texts are the same. What about authentication? Is that important? Yes. What does authentication mean in this context? That you are who you say you are. That I am who I say I am, but I'm just messages, yeah. 
method that you get actually from the person you think you're getting from. Yes, yeah. so the method, similar concept, but framed in the way of these crypto systems, is that if I receive a message and I think it's from one of you, then I actually know that it's from one of you, right? So you think about, like, for instance, let's say somebody sent me an email <laughs> saying, hey, I'd like to change my uh, password on the submission server. My user, my hacker alias is foobar. I go and change foobars, but I never authenticate that the person who sent me that message actually was that person. And now they know this password and can change it. Um, some other security benefits we didn't talk about that we'll get into, I mean, that we'll see how it's done. So non-repudiation, what does that mean? What does repudiation mean? Fancy word? Denying. Um, Denying what? Sending the or receiving. Denying that you ever sent the message, right? Repudiation would be like, I never sent that message. So what would non-repudiation mean? You can't do that. You can't do that, yes. <laughs> it's not a trick question. Uh, so this would mean you can use cryptography to do something like you can tell your um, your banking firm to sell a thousand shares of a stock. And they go and do that, but the stock tanks. You can't then go and say, "Well, I never sent that message. Somebody else must have sent that." Right. So you think about it in terms of a little bit in terms of authentication of who sent it, but verifying that this person actually sent this message uh, in a essentially a cryptographic way, which is good. Cool. Okay, so we can formally define a crypto system, and this is kind of the standard way to define this. E Never mind, I'm just gonna do something silly. So we have E and D. These are already very easy. We already discussed them. What are they? Encryption, decryption. Encryption and decryption, right? Some functions to encrypt, some functions to decrypt. M is the set of possible plain text. Why is why do you care about this? If it's, it's too small, then you can. Yeah, or you think about, um, has anybody done a very simple, basic encryption scheme when they were younger? You ever write notes in class? And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, what did you do? Did you, were you able to encrypt arbitrary bytes? Did you send a JPEG to somebody? <laughs> no, what did your encryption scheme work on? <coughs> Text, right? Usually A through Z, right? Even just 30, you know, the English alphabet. Um, and so that's why this is important, is thinking about what is the set of possible plain text. So is it all English characters? Is it alphanumeric? Is it arbitrary bytes, which is really what we care about now? Um, and you think about back in like wartime, this is actually what they were, they weren't sending arbitrary messages, right? Think about like World War II era. They're sending like messages to each other in, usually not English, but in whatever the language is of that other country. Um, so then K is some set of keys, as we'll talk about. Usually you need some kind of keys here. You don't just get encryption for free or crypto systems for free. And we'll see how those are used. And then C is the set of ciphertext. So why is this different than M? This might be different. That might be different, right? You may have, you may, you can think of, so then E takes in what? if we think about this set here. So if you model E as a function, what does this function accept as input? M. M, probably M star or something like that, right? Um, the all possible things that are inside this set M, and it outputs what? C. C, and then decryption is the opposite. It takes in ciphertext, outputs <coughs> plain text. So look at this, very did this. This is, and so, the, the twist that we haven't yet talked about, which we're doing right now, is uh, the encryption function will take in some key and out, use that to output some ciphertext, and whereas the decryption function will also take in a key. So this is, so uh, we will actually get into the, right now, the most famous cipher. So has anyone ever accidentally invented a Caesar cipher? Do you know what this is? Yeah, substitution. So the idea is, and not just substitution, so your key is going to be some number from, well, zero would be terrible, but from like 1 to 26. So you adjust every letter forward k number of characters. So if it's 1, you would move every character forward 1 to encrypt. And this was actually a legitimate 
cipher. This was used back in the days, uh, in the early Roman days. Um, as this is talking about Julius Caesar in the year 56, and it says, if he had anything confidential to say, he wrote it in cipher. That is, by so changing the order of the letters of the alphabet, that not a word could be made out. If anyone wishes to decipher these and get their meaning, he must substitute the fourth letter of the alphabet, namely D, for A, and so on with the others. So this is a text from, what's this, almost 2,000 years ago or so, of an encryption algorithm of how to encrypt text. So when we come back and see each other on, what's it, Tuesday? Uh, we will talk about this, we'll go through this, how to attack it, all that fun stuff.